Uh, then now we'll start the first session with the title, what are the best surgical treatment options for me? Minimally invasive surgery or robotic. With this said, please join me in welcoming the moderators, speakers, and panelists for the first session. We <clears throat> kindly ask Professor Han Gwang Yang, the Chairman of Board of Directors in Korean Cancer Association, Professor Yasuhiro Kodera, former Chairman, Auditor, Board of Directors in Japanese Gastric Cancer Association, and Professor Jia Fuji, Vice President, Board of Directors in Chinese Anti-Cancer Association to moderate the session, please. Yes, uh, uh, as uh, 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 Ms. Eidemann uh, introduced, uh, uh, this time we have uh, quite a uh, 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 few, uh, several uh, patient advocacy groups. So I hope uh, through this uh, activity, uh, this uh, patient advocacy group from all over the world can uh, communicate, learn from each other, and uh, also uh, uh, give us uh, doctors uh, what they need uh, and so on. And uh, the session number one is about a surgical. Session number two is about uh, chemotherapy. And uh, uh, first uh, uh, session, uh, uh, I would like to uh, ask uh, uh, the other two uh, moderators to present uh, uh, speakers and uh, uh, speakers will be introduced by uh, these two uh, moderators, but I would like to uh, introduce, uh, we have a uh, uh, panelist, uh, 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 Professor Paul Mansfield. Uh, he is a president of uh, uh, International Gas Cancer Association and also uh, 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 Professor Dubo, uh, who is uh, president of a European Society of Social Oncology uh, from Italy. And uh, uh, Professor Shi Jie Kan, uh, he is uh, uh, from uh, uh, he is a professor of surgery at the Nanjing um, uh, Medical School, uh, uh, first affiliate hospital. And uh, also uh, uh, Dr. Brian uh, Bet, he is from MD Anderson. He served as the Secretary General for uh, the uh, last uh, uh, International Gastric Cancer uh, Congress held in uh, Houston. And uh, we have also a patient. Uh, uh, panel, uh, Ms. Uh, Melanie uh, Vin uh, Vincelli from United States and uh, uh, Chisang Won uh, from Korea. And uh, so now, uh, uh, Professor Kodera, could you uh, introduce uh, first uh, speaker? Okay, uh, first speaker is Professor Sang Uk Han, who's a chairman board of directors at Korean Gastric Cancer Association. He is a graduate of uh, Seoul National University, and he is currently a professor in Department of Surgery and director of Azure University Hospital. Uh, he is, today, he's going to talk to us about, um, um, well, it's a case present early gastric cancer in the interim, and he's going to speak about, especially about robotic distal gastrectomy. For the interest of time, please uh, continue, uh, start your talk. Morning, ladies and gentlemen. I am Sang Khan from Aju University, Korea. It is a great honor for me to be invited in International Gastric Cancer Education Symposium, which was hosted by uh, Davis Dream Foundation and the Korea C uh, Cancer Association. Today, I will uh, talk about a case of uh, gastric cancer who was conducted with robotic distal gastrectomy. Eastern Asia is the most endemic area of gastric cancer. Among Eastern Asia, Koreans have the highest reported instance of gastric cancer in 2018 in both males and females. I would like to introduce the current status of gastric cancer in Korea. Uh, gastric cancer is the most common cancer and the fourth most common cause of cancer-related deaths in Korea. Uh, the proportion of early gastric cancer consistently increased uh, from 28.6% uh, in 1995 to 63.6% in 2019. Uh, the operative approach has markedly changed over time, 
and the proportion of minimal invasive surgery, including laparoscopic and robotic surgery, has increased from 60.6% uh, in 2004 uh, to 72% uh, in 2019. After distal gastrectomy, the bilos 2 reconstruction was uh, most commonly performed method, uh, followed by bilos 1 and ruen y reconstruction. As we know, surgery is the most essential uh, treatment which can cure gastric cancer. Uh, resection of primary tumor and the dissection of lymph node is necessary uh, for achieving R0 resection, which means complete removal of cancer. And safe reconstruction uh, is also important for patients' quality of life. Uh, Gastrectomy via an open abdominal approach has been performed for more than 100 years. Open gastrectomy remains the mainstay of curative approach for gastric cancer for a long time. However, open surgery has the disadvantages of high surgical stress, such as more blood loss, high complication rate, and severe post-operative pain. On the other hand, laparoscopy is a type of surgical procedure which allows a surgeon to assess inside of the abdomen without having uh, to make large incision in the skin. Therefore, surgical stress of uh, laparoscopic surgery is less than uh, that of open surgery. The benefits of laparoscopic surgery are less blood loss, uh, low complication rate, and less post-operative pain. Another minimal invasive surgery is robotic uh, uh, cancer surgery. In early 2000, uh, the Da Vinci uh, system was introduced and it was applied to the field of gastric cancer surgery. Uh, high, technique, uh, high technology the Da Vinci system often uh, the ear of robotic surgery and it can provide uh, some advantages for surgeons uh, such as three-dimensional view and the articulated graspers. Uh, the case of uh, laparoscopic surgery in case in, co in Korea also has increased. Uh, this table is the co uh, contents of today's uh, talk. Uh, we prepared a case who received the robot distal gastrectomy uh, this year. Uh, 64-year-old male patient was referred from other clinic. Uh, gastric cancer was detected uh, with routine check endoscopy. The tumor was located on great curvature side of the uh, mid antrum and early gastric cancer type 2A plus 2C with T1B depth was suspected. Abdominal CT showed uh, suspicious wall thickening in uh, great curvature of antrum so we thought uh, the clinical stage was uh, T1B N0 M0. We decided to perform distal gastrectomy because the tumor located on the lower third of the stomach. I prefer plus one anastomosis after distal gastrectomy because I believe this method is the best way to maintain normal food pathway. From now, I would like to show you a short video of robot uh, distal gastrectomy with plus one anastomosis. We divided the duodenum after lymph node dissection and uh, stomach was divided also with a linear stapler. We need uh, two uh, linear stapler for dividing uh, stomach. Uh, we opened the duodenum stump for gastric duodenum stomach. And another opening was made on the great curvature of the stomach. 
we checked uh, the lumen of the stomach. We inserted a linear stapler into the stomach and uh, into the duodenum for gastroduodenal stomach. We fired the stapler. For this time, uh, we used uh, three tools of robot system uh, to close the entry hole like this. And one more stepper was needed to close this entry hole. It is very easy and very secure if we use a robot system like this. Uh, we fired the step line. Finally, we made very beautiful uh, gastroduodenostomy. Uh, patient recovered smoothly uh, without complication, and he discharged uh, post-operative day six. Uh, pathology report showed uh, uh, tubular adenocarcinoma was a mod uh, moderate differentiated type and uh, it was a early gut cancer type 2C uh, with ulcer in the center and the size was a 2 cm uh, depth of invasion was uh, submucosa uh, so, and uh, there was no metastasis in 27 uh, harvested uh, regional lymph nodes. So uh, from now I will talk about uh, endoscopic resection versus surgery. This table shows current indication of EST in Japan and Korea. For differentiated type uh, without ulceration, EST is indicated regardless of the size. With ulceration, EST is possible. Uh, tumor size is less than uh, 3 cm. For undifferentiated type, EST is recommended. Uh, tumor size is less than 2 cm without ulceration. And EST should be done in mucosal tumor. Our case was a submucosal cancer, so we decided to do gastrectomy other than EST. According to the Japanese gastric cancer treatment guideline, for T1B tumor, uh, gastrectomy with D1 plus lymph node dissection is recommended. According to uh, Korean guideline, uh, for T1B tumor, surgery is also recommended. From now, I will talk about uh, minimal invasive surgery, such as laparoscopic surgery and robot surgery. Uh, laparoscopic surgery is just considered as an option to treat uh, early gastric cancer according to Japanese guideline. However, according to Korean uh, guideline, uh, laparoscopic surgery is strongly recommended. Uh, because of uh, uh, bet, uh, faster recovery and uh, less complication and uh, better uh, quality of life and the same uh, long-term survival was proved uh, very uh, important uh, trial such as a class zero one trial uh, from Korea. About uh, robotic surgery, according to the uh, retrospective studies, uh, robot gastrectomy shows uh, reduced blood loss, larger number of retrieved lymph nodes uh, than conventional laparoscopic gastrectomy, and the long-term oncologic outcomes are similar uh, to those of uh, laparoscopic gastrectomy. So, uh, robot gastrectomy is feasible and safe 
and easy to run. However, advantage over uh, laparoscopic gastrectomy are not obvious from the patient's standpoint. And uh, in our group, uh, we compared the robotic and the laparoscopic gastrectomy with a propensity score weighted uh, analysis. As you can see, uh, robot surgery showed less blood loss and the more harvested lymph nodes, especially in suprapancreatic lymph node dissection. And uh, uh, the long term survival was the same. So uh, I personally prefer a robotic uh, gastrectomy uh, compared to uh, then uh, laparoscopic surgery. So, 3D visualization and articulated wrist stabilized camera and the fluorescent imaging. The advantages only robot have. So, in my opinion, a short learning curve and the more habited lymph nodes are good advantages for surgeon and less post-operative complication and the comparable uh, survival outcomes are some benefits for patients. This is my conclusion. Uh, thank you very much uh, for your kind attention. Thank you. Thank you very much, Professor Han. And um, before we go on to the next session, just one question. What is the percentage of robotic surgery which was conducted in your institution, in Agile University? Uh, <clears throat> thank you very much for your uh, kind uh, question. Uh, in our hospital, uh, one, two. That means 30% uh, uh, is uh, robotic surgery and 70% uh, uh, is uh, uh, laparoscopic surgery. Okay, thank in you. Minimal invasive surgery. Yeah, um, you do uh, recommend robotic surgery, but still at this time you perform thirty percent in by robotic surgery. And I think that is a point of discussion uh, later. Anyway, Professor Yang, what would you suggest? We have uh, forty more minutes, and we have another another very important presentation. Would you hope to hear from Professor Strong before we go into the discussion? Uh, we may, uh, yes, uh, because uh, today uh, this. Uh, uh, Conference hall is uh, after this conference hall. There's uh, no uh, uh, activity, oh. so uh, uh -huh. you have uh, because of, uh, uh, because of uh, Professor uh, Han's presentation about the surgical, especially he emphasized the robot. I think uh, uh, audience uh, might be interested in uh, really uh, robot is uh, better uh, okay. or so. Uh, uh, we will discuss maybe ten minutes, then okay. uh, we will move uh, to others. So. so uh, Professor uh, Kodera, I would like to ask uh, a few uh, of uh, from each uh, country, like uh, Paul Mansfield, uh, Ji Jiao Fu, or uh, uh, so uh, uh, about uh, from your point of view, uh, you agree with uh, Dr. Han's uh, presentation about uh, more lymph nodes uh, better? Uh, is this consistent results? Uh, 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 so I want to uh, ask. Uh, Professor Paul Mansfield about uh, his opinion uh, from uh, United States. Sure. Um, first, I'd like to thank the organizers and uh, Debbie's Dream uh, Foundation for the opportunity to be here and for bringing this uh, esteemed group together. Uh, I, as we discussed at the uh, International Gastric Cancer Congress after the uh, excellent presentation of Paulo Kassab, uh, I think one of the things that we, we wrestle with and I wrestle with is we, we do some extraordinary things with technology, uh, expensive techniques, um, but how far can they be applied out into the community? How far can they be applied out into all of the, the many millions of patients uh, over a few year period? Uh, that actually need this kind of, of uh, care. And so uh, the, the resource intensity for something like a, uh, a laparoscopic uh, resection versus a robotic section are, are vastly different. 
Uh, and I think, you, as you alluded to, uh, we do see the, the difference of, uh, there may be a statistical difference in the number of lymph nodes or the amount of blood loss, but it is, is it a material or a clinically significant difference in those events? And is that worth the added uh, um, resource concentration? So that, those are, I, I think, you know, if you're having how you, how you get a great result, um, uh, I think uh, matters a little bit less than actually getting the great result. Okay. Uh, then uh, 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 Professor Qi Jiaofu, uh, China, how, how uh, uh, Chinese doctors uh, accept uh, robotic surgery? Microphone on, please. Uh, I'm also uh, honored to be here and uh, Debbie uh, Dream Foundation uh, get together uh, our this uh, platform. Uh, I also uh, totally agree, uh, Professor Power, uh, whatever the robot uh, procedure, open procedure in um, Lapsaho, uh, uh, procedure, uh, just a procedure, and uh, lymph node uh, col uh, uh, collect uh, lymph nodes uh, depend on the surgeon, also pathology department. And uh, I think a minimal invasion procedure just uh, for the early uh, uh, stage in the gastric cancer, and also yeah, maybe uh, 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 Vivian Strong uh, will introduce us uh, after new adjuvant chemotherapy downstage patient also uh, benefit from the minimal invasion uh, uh, procedure. In China, uh, also uh, minimal invasion, the procedure is uh, uh, only for the early stage. And also we try to uh, the after new adjuvant chemotherapy and uh, give patient uh, less pain and the benefit the, from the uh, quality and 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 so on and thank you, Professor Kodera, Please continue. I think Professor Mansfield has raised his hand. What? Uh, any questions? I just wanted to follow on uh, on uh, Professor Gfadi's um, comment. I think it's it's not just the minimally invasive. I think we also have to recognize the profound impact of all of the ERAS and the changes in how we manage patients perioperatively that has had a profound impact on length of stay, uh, even for people who have open procedures. Uh, and so I think we have to look at that whole picture. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That's really quite true. Yeah. Yeah. So uh, uh, let me uh, uh, share our experience. Our uh, data uh, demonstrate that uh, even when we use uh, propensity score matching, a distal gastrectomy, total gastrectomy, uh, uh, laparoscope versus open uh, robot surgery, we did not see any difference in lymph node number retrieve or complication. So uh, we are telling patient. Uh, uh, no difference in uh, robot versus uh, uh, laparoscope. So our patient, uh, they are choosing uh, laparoscope and uh, we are applying uh, robot surgery uh, about 10% uh, or even less. So uh, at this moment, uh, as long as uh, we use a uh, uh, ultrasonic device, in Korea, most of the surgeons use an ultrasonic device. I am not uh, sure it really can uh, 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 make a, a big difference. So. Uh, uh, depending on the uh, 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 report from Institute, it has been uh, different. Professor Kodera. So uh, I think the message to the patient would be that, you know, if we had Da Vinci 20 years ago, we might have gone to Da Vinci straight from open surgery, but we didn't. And, you know, we had to do laparoscopic surgery. It does need long training, but we have been training for, you know, about 20 years. And we are actually a good laparoscopic surgeon. So I, th I don't think the patient will have to rush to the doctors who does robotic surgery. If the doctor says, you know, he is very proficient in laparoscopic surgery, but he's a beginning in robotic surgery, it's not always a good idea to opt for robotic surgery. That's my opinion. Yeah. 
So as also, Professor Yang said, it's quite similar. The outcome is quite similar. Yeah. And also, it is the problem with uh, robotic surgery is that uh, it's a uh, very expensive at this moment. And uh, in the near future, uh, we will have uh, more uh, industries uh, uh, produce different uh, robotics. Yeah, absolutely. I'm uh, I'm expecting in the maybe five or ten years later, we will use more robot. But at this moment, uh, not strong evidence and also uh, more expensive. That's the problem. But on the other hand, the robot may prolong the lives of surgeons because it's less stressful. I think yeah. some of these aspects could be heard for also from Prof Professor Strong, you know. So uh, how about going on to uh, Dr. Strong's talk now? Yes. Is it okay? Uh, yes, let's uh, uh, do that. Uh, uh, Professor Ji Jiao Fu, please. Okay. Uh, is uh, uh, your uh, speaker, please. Okay, uh, next speaker is uh, Professor Vivian Strong, uh, who is a professor uh, of uh, MSK uh, Cancer Center and also Weinstein uh, Well Cornell uh, Medical College and uh, Cornell uh, University and and uh, she will uh, give us a, a case for new adjuvant chemotherapy for robot total gastrectomy for locally advanced gastric cancer. Uh, Vivian Strong, please. Good afternoon. My name is Dr. Vivian Strong, and I'm a surgical oncologist specializing in gastric cancer at Memorial Sloan Kettering Cancer Center. I would like to thank Debbie's Dream Foundation and the Korean Cancer Association for the invitation to give this discussion at the International Gastric Cancer Educational Symposium for Patients. On the topic of chemotherapy followed by robotic total gastrectomy for gastric cancer. Before beginning, I would like to point out that gastric cancer is a problem that can affect all of us, male, female, young and old, and all racial subtypes, as seen by this slide of famous people who died of stomach cancer. We all know that gastric cancer globally is a health concern with over 1 million new cases annually, making it the fifth most common cancer and the third cause of cancer deaths in the world. Although the global distribution of gastric cancer varies by region of the world, higher in uh, Asia and Eastern Europe, pockets in South America, you can see that in the United States, this is a real problem. And it's increasing, not just in the US, but in other parts of the world as well. This shows how gastric cancer numbers continue to climb, both in the United States, in South Korea, and in Japan. What's even more alarming is in the United States, this increase is largely accounted for by people under the age of 40 with a 70% increase in the incidence of non-cardiac gastric tumors. The reasons for this are not entirely clear. However, we do know many risk factors exist for developing stomach cancer. There are some genetic risk factors, including certain mutations that predispose you to developing certain types of stomach cancer, like hereditary diffuse gastric, gastric cancer and Lynch syndrome. And there are infectious causes most notably H. pylori infection, although Epstein-Barr virus, as well as others, and a host of environmental factors that can increase your risk for developing stomach cancer, such as those listed here. Now let's get right into the case presentation that I've been asked to give. Uh, we'll talk about a 61-year-old patient of mine who was on Eliquis, a blood thinner, that actually caused him to have some acute coughing up of blood, which prompted an immediate trip to the hospital and admission. He does have some medical problems, including atrial fibrillation and heart disease. This is why he was on uh, his blood thinner, hypertension, asthma, and so forth. He did have a 30-pack year smoking history and some use of alcohol with a family history of some cancers. Um, although on endoscopy, uh, and while he was admitted, he had an endoscopy, which showed the reason for the bleeding, a large ulcerated mass two centimeters below the top of his stomach. 
So when you're diagnosed with stomach cancer, the way to make this diagnosis is with an endoscopy where they place a scope down into the stomach, as you can see here. That showed in this patient of mine, you can see the tumor right here at the top of the stomach, this ulcerated mass. And oftentimes this will also be followed by an endoscopic ultrasound. You can see the endoscopic ultrasound device, just like a gastroscope, but with an ultrasound probe which gives us important information. It lets us determine whether or not we have an early or middle stage stomach cancer. In this case, the endoscopic ultrasound revealed an early uh, middle stage stomach cancer. We get other clues by getting a CAT scan. All patients will get a CAT scan of the chest, abdomen, and pelvis. If we can see signs of the tumor on the CAT scan, if we can see enlarged lymph nodes, we know it's not an early gastric cancer, as was the case in, in my patient. Furthermore, oftentimes, especially in the United States, we will get PET scans. It gives us a different view of the tumor and what's happening in the body. You can see here that in, in my patient's case, a large mass in the top of the stomach, where, which lights up because this is the cancer. However, luckily, nothing elsewhere. The PET scans can be very useful because sometimes, as you can see in this other patient, um, there were signs that the tumor that this patient unfortunately had had already spread to the chest area and also spread to a spot in the liver that you can see right here. And this is important because it gives us clues as to the stage of the disease and the best way we can treat you to help with the stomach cancer. So we determined this middle stage tumor in my patient his CAT scan and PET scan looked clear, so he's set to go ahead with treatment, or is he? Gastric cancer staging can be a long process, but we have good reasons for it. In this case, I recommended diagnostic laparoscopy, which we do for all middle stage tumors. And why do we do this? First of all, the diagnostic laparoscopy is a procedure that's done in the, in the operating room. You go home the same day, so it's an in and out procedure. But very important information is obtained from this. It's not just an extra test. It helps us in terms of the staging. And this is what I'll show you. This was not the patient we're talking about right now, but another pa unfortunate patient of mine who had a completely clear CAT scan and PET scan. When we went in to look on diagnostic laparoscopy, we found these small pebble-like sized nodules over the peritoneum and this part of the ligament these were not seen on scans, but this is a sign of stage four disease. It's very important that we know this ahead of time. And the reason is studies have shown that when you do have cancer cells surrounding in the abdominal cavity, so here's the stomach, but we're talking about the abdominal cavity, the lining of the abdominal cavity. We know that people who have this do very poorly. They don't have a very good survival rate. They behave in a way that's consistent with late stage disease. And chemotherapy is absolutely imperative, not surgery. Um, with those with negative disease, they do better. In fact, positive cytology, meaning cancer cells diagnosed outside of the stomach in the abdominal lining, is actually classified as M1 or stage four disease by the American Joint Cancer Commission, the AGCC, as well as the NCCN. These are two governing guidelining uh, committees that help us to um, figure out the best treatment for stomach cancer. Fortunately for my patient, all of his results from the diagnostic laparoscopy were negative for malignant cells from the fluid samples we collected, making him consistent with this uh, middle stage, but potentially curable stomach cancer. The other thing we often will do is get immunohistochemistry or special markers to look at various components or characteristics of the tumor. It's not just a gastric cancer, but it could be a DNA mismatch repair protein gastric cancer or one that expresses HER2, PDL1, or Epstein Barr virus. These are the four markers that we typically look for on every one of our gastric cancers. If someone has a defect in the mismatch repair proteins or a high PDL1 expression or EBV uh, positive, if that were the case, not in this patient, then they may be candidates for immunotherapy. There's another type of treatment, trastuzumab, that a patient may be a candidate for if they're HER2 positive.
In this case, this patient did not have expression of any of these markers, but we check nonetheless. So middle stage, many tests that we need in order to figure out the best approach to treat this cancer, but they're for good reason. If these patients have um, PET scans and uh, diagnostic lab all look clear, these people will go on to get preoperative chemotherapy. So neoadjuvant or preoperative FLOT, which is a special combination of 5-FU, a leucovorin, an oxaliplatin, and an taxol. If they have a marker that's consistent with an MSI high tumor or one of these mismatch repair proteins, then we go straight to gastrectomy. And that's a topic for another case presentation. So in this case, our patient had a marker negative tumor infiltrating adenocarcinoma middle stage. So what would the next step be? As we talked about, neoadjuvant chemotherapy with four cycles of FLOT. You may ask, why do chemo up front and not just go right to surgery? So the concept and the reason that we do this is because when people have middle stage tumors, you see the tumor here, and even if there are surrounding lymph nodes involved, these can be approached with an operation. We can remove this part of the stomach. However, the issue is middle stage patients with middle stage tumors have a very high probability of having microscopic metastatic disease, these little red dots that could be microscopically anywhere in the system. You can't see them on CAT scan, you can't see them on PET scan, but these are important areas to eradicate. We can do that with chemotherapy up front, clear out these microscopic cells, and then go in to remove the tumor. And this is our rationale. We have evidence behind this rationale. In fact, we know that for middle stage disease, 90% of recurrences that happen are distant, meaning they happen away from the area of the stomach, the lungs, the livers, uh, the lungs, the liver, bone. And we do know from other studies that have been done, this is from the MAGIC trial that was published in the New England Journal of Medicine, that when patients have surgery alone with middle stage disease, they do less well than when they get preoperative chemotherapy. You can see there's about a 13% improvement in survival by getting preoperative chemo. Why wouldn't you wanna do that? Um, another study more recently in the Lancet 2019, this is where FLOT was discovered as being even a better chemotherapy approach than the chemotherapy seen in this study. You can see that ECX, which was the uh, chemotherapy in this study compared to FLOT, FLOT improved survival even more so over the ECX. Therefore, this patient showed a good response of tumor after the chemotherapy completed. His PET scan showed improvement and he came back for surgery. What was the operation? We talked about a robotic total gastrectomy with ruin Y reconstruction and a D2 lymphadenectomy. So the first questions, question patients will ask me is, why do I need my whole stomach out, and can I live without a stomach? The first answer to that is yes, you can live a normal life and a good quality life without a stomach. In fact, all the people in this picture have no stomachs. This was an article from the Wall Street Journal that was published a couple of years ago. This is a, these are patients of mine. This is the father who had a gene causing him to have a type of stomach cancer and his daughter who had her stomach removed because she has the same gene one year later. This photo was taken one year after her operation. You can see both of them looking well. He runs a business, she's a lawyer and they're doing very well um, after they had their stomachs removed and cancer free. This is another set of patients, all five siblings, all of them have no stomachs. And you can see that this is, you can go on to have a good life. You wouldn't know that these people have no stomachs. We did study what quality of life looks like after your stomach is removed. This is a study from our institution at Sloan Kettering in 40 patients. We specifically looked at issues of weight loss and found that in this, in this graph, you see people with their preoperative weight or BMI and postoperative at least six months after. These are all paired with pre and postoperative weights. And you can see that in almost all cases, pa patients were able to maintain a normal weight. Only very few patients dipped to what we call underweight categories, some of which had already started there. But everyone man managed to um, uh, 
find a good uh, stable level by about six months. In fact, 85% of patients said that they had outcomes better or as expected, although 40% did say that they had some dietary modifications. However, all patients who were working before surgery returned to full-time work. Now, what about the robotic total gastrectomy? So when patients have tumors in the upper part of the stomach, this is typically the reconstruction that we do, total gastrectomy. Also, lymph nodes are involved. These are little nodes that the tumor can spread to surrounding the stomach or in distant areas. Many patients say, what is a lymph node? I wanted to show you a picture from one of my intraoperative photos from a few weeks ago. Here's the stomach. And you can see here, this grasper is pushing up on this little tan area. That is a lymph node. There's another one here. There's another one here. You can see a few of them. There's another one here. But these are the lymph nodes that tumors will start to spread to in middle stage disease. Now, what about robotic approaches? We have great experience with minimally invasive surgery. From the first laparoscopic gastrectomy in 1994, done by one of our Japanese um, uh, professors, Professor Katano, smaller trials, both from Italy and these are from South Korea, showed that the outcomes are the same, robotic versus open. Then larger scale studies, this one from Korea, this one from Japan, showed that outcomes are the same, whether it's um, for early gastric cancer. But what about middle stage disease? There are four randomized prospective studies. Each of these studies have over 1,000 patients that participated, randomized to laparoscopic versus open approaches, <clears throat> and found that uh, this, this one is from China, from Japan, from Korea, and this one from the Netherlands. All of these studies showed oncologically equivalent outcomes. In other words, you can have a minimally invasive approach even with middle stage disease, and you will still have the same chance of having a cure. Um, robotic uh, versus lap, the robotic approaches may even offer fewer complications, better lymph node dissections. There are other things that could be potential advantages. In the West, we have a good experience with robotic gastrectomy as well. This is again from my institution, robotic gastrectomy in uh, and outcomes in 220 patients. You can see here that patients can have this approach, although of course, if you've had pre-op chemo, if you have a large tumor, or if you're extremely overweight, these are factors that might cause a conversion to an open approach. We also looked at long-term outcomes in 845 patients with open and minimally invasive gastrectomies, finding equivalent outcomes. So we've been able to replicate the same things found by some of the large randomized trials from Asia. So minimally invasive surgery, it will offer you decreased hospital stay, less pain, there's less blood loss, and most importantly, you can get back to work and life quicker. That is our goal as surgeons. We want to help you get back to your work and your life. Fewer adhesions for those who live um, you know, uh, long enough to have other kinds of issues like appendicitis or gallbladder issues. The more people that we can cure and the longer they're, they're getting from the time of their surgery, um, the more this becomes an issue. Also, patients who need to go on and get chemotherapy after surgery, they're able to do it more quickly. In fact, our study, uh, a study from our institution found that patients who had the same stage of disease and needed chemo after surgery more of them were able to get it with a minimally invasive approach. This was also uh, validated by a large randomized trial in China. They also found the same findings. Patients could go on to get their chemo faster. And one last thing, we are looking for ways to have better reconstructive techniques for our patients. Rather than give them a total gastrectomy, there are other options that we're exploring. Instead of getting a total gastrectomy, there is a gastric pouch that we can create out of intestine. There's also something called a proximal gastrectomy. So for patients who have tumors in the upper part of their stomach, like this patient, in the past two to three years, there has been interest from the South Korean group in doing a proximal gastrectomy with double track reconstruction. There is a randomized prospective trial that's ongoing to evaluate how this will help patients in terms of quality of life but we already know that there is less anemia, in other words, less need for blood transfusions and no need for vitamin B12 repletion with this approach. So this is something new that we can offer our patients. 
jejunal interposition. This is another approach. You can see a, a limb of intestine that connects the esophagus to the distal stomach. All ways to try and um, save more of the stomach. This patient, he, we removed the whole cancer. The margins were negative, and he was downstage from a stage three to a stage one B tumor with a 50% treatment response from the chemo. Now, downstaging is not the same as having a stage one tumor. You can see he started as a stage three tumor with about a 54% five-year survival. After downstaging, his survival is not the same as a stage one up front, but after surgery, still a much improved survival because of the chemotherapy. Three weeks after this operation, uh, our patient returned to receive several more cycles of chemotherapy at two years, no signs of recurrence. So the take-home points, we know that chemotherapy for middle-stage gastric cancer, especially in the West, is safe and it improves survival. Both LAP and robotic approaches provide equivalent cancer operations to the open approach, and quality of life is good, even with the total gastrectomy, although we are evaluating other options to try and continue to improve our outcomes for all of you. Thank you very much for your attention. Okay, thank you, Professor uh, Vivian uh, Strom. Uh, good case, and uh, after new adjuvant chemotherapy, and uh, give patient robot total gastrectomy. And any question or comment? I think uh, Professor Han Guang Yang. Well, Professor Ji Jiao Fu, uh, you are supposed to give more chances to other experts. <laughs> Maybe uh, we can <laughs> ask uh, 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 Professor Cordera about uh, no, as well. uh, he gave a nice lecture yesterday at the AOS. Uh, uh, how about uh, uh, ro uh, our practice in Asia? Uh, no, as well, treatment uh, in Europe, as uh, uh, Dr. Vivian Strong uh, uh, mentioned, uh, the flood study <coughs> uh, was uh, recently uh, positive. So uh, it, it looks like it, uh, as a standard. Uh, but uh, how about uh, no, as well, in uh, as Asia, especially Japan, any evidence? Okay, um, yeah, in Asia, gastric cancer is generally found at an earlier stage. So, you know, and we are really committed to early detection for a long time. So actually we prefer to perform surgery as quickly as possible and give the chemotherapy afterwards to cope with micrometastasis. And chemotherapy then is still effective. However, we do have some advanced or aggressive cancers also in Asia, and chemotherapy, which used to be quite useless, became more and more effective and powerful. But also, they have become more toxic, and it is no longer easy to give them to patients who have feeding problems after you know, having their stomach taken out. So we have greater interest in chemotherapy before surgery than we did before, and we do have some data from Korea and China in support of that strategy. But in Japan, we do not have convincing clinical data in support of chemotherapy before surgery, and the outcome of patients who received chemotherapy was not superior to those who did not in our clinical trial. However, that is not to say that patients who received chemotherapy before surgery did badly. And when we looked at the resected stomach with microscopes, we often found evidence of a lot of cancer cells that were destroyed due to chemotherapy. So actually, we do not hesitate to give chemotherapy when a patient has massive or what we call bulky tumor, or when the surgery will have to be postponed for some reason, like pandemic. That is the current situation in Asia and also in Japan. May I add some comment? Yeah. Yeah, Dr. Tugo, go ahead. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. First, first of all, let me express my most profound thanks for the privilege of being with you today in uh, this educational symposium. And since it is an educational message that this uh, wonderful group of experts is called to spread, I would like to uh, express my comment regarding Vivian Strong presentation because uh, you know she has highlighted two very important points. Uh, I mean, uh, gastric.
pituitary cancer is probably the kind of solid tumor that uh, more than any other uh, reflects the need of high quality multidisciplinary treatment. And uh, in her presentation, it's rather clear that in uh, pre-operative neoadjuvant chemotherapy, we need more personalized choices. And then she's also highlighted the importance of precision surgery through any kind of innovative technology. So uh, we should not take a look at the trials and apply according to the European guidelines, new adjuvant for all. Any patient is, is getting the same kind of drugs. You know, as she showed, there are certain kinds of tumor, for example, the, the ones with the microsatellite instability, that have on one hand a, 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 a less, less uh, uh, aggressiveness, but no response at all. Is in this patient the case of going directly to surgery or there is something new? There are interesting experiences in Europe and also in some other countries where immunotherapy could be the best choice instead of uh, chemotherapy for this kind of patient before surgery. There are other kinds of patients that show her due positivity. And in these patients flawed that as the Dr. Codera highlighted, sometimes is too uh, toxic for these patients that are facing a project of invasive uh, gastrectomy. But uh, the add of trastuzumab in her two positive patients can uh, uh, increase the results giving uh, you know, upfront the, uh, the surgery, the, the, the downstage that is our final goal. On the other hand, robotics. Is robotics the, the best way of treating advanced cancer? Well, uh, of course we have demonstrated like in the trials that have been showed non-inferiority of these techniques, but we need more. In some conferences that I used to take, I see is less more. Well, there are evidences in our gestures that sometimes less is more for the sake of a better precision surgery. There are evidences that just not just removing lymph nodes, but removing the entire embryological sac containing the pathways in embryological pathways that have been so importantly highlighted in surgery of the rectum. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Uh, uh, Professor uh, Chi Chao Fu, uh, uh, because uh, 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 Dr. Vivian Strong mentioned about uh, double track reconstruction, we happen to have uh, uh, the PI, principal Im investigator of uh, that uh, study, in, uh, uh, he's in, in the studio. Uh, Dr. Do Jung Park, MC of today, he is a PI over that study. So uh, we may listen from him uh, briefly about the uh, result, uh, uh, although uh, uh, Vivian Strong uh, mentioned. Uh, so uh, uh, can, can we uh, listen from him about- uh, Yeah, briefly? okay. Uh, thank you. Uh, thank you, Professor Yang and uh, uh, Professor Vivian Strong. I really uh, uh, enjoyed your lecture. Uh, so, uh, as I uh, as a principal investigator of Class Zero Five, uh, comparing laparoscopic proximal gastrectomy with the double track reconstruction with the total gastrectomy in upper third or gastric cancer. Uh, our final result showed uh, laparoscopic proximal gastrectomy has had advantage over toral gastrectomy in terms of uh, uh, preserved the vitamin B12 uh, level and uh, uh, showed a better quality of life uh, such as uh, uh, physical functioning and social functioning. And without any compromise of uh, complications such as reflux esophagitis, actually reflux, uh, the rate of reflux esophagitis is really nearly the same, 2.9% uh, as the toral gastrectomy. So the, uh, the reason why proximal gastrectomy was uh, uh, reluctant to all surgeons uh, uh, disappeared if we adopt uh, proximal gastrectomy with the double-track reconstruction. So, 
uh, and we are trying to expand a little the indication of a proximal gastrectomy for the T2 cancer, uh, such as T2 cancer. So, but uh, as of now, the, I think uh, proximal gastrectomy is uh, applicable to the early gastric cancer. Thank you. Yeah, okay. thank you very much. And uh, uh, then I want to uh, ask uh, Dr. Cordera, uh, this double tract reconstruction is a very long history. Uh, it was uh, developed in Japan and uh, it was uh, used, uh, tried by open surgery. And uh, so although uh, our Korean uh, study showed some result, how about uh, 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 popularity of uh, double tract reconstruction in Japan? Do you use a uh, uh, for the uh, early gas cancer uh, in upper third, do you do a double track or a, a total gas tracking? Oh, I think there was some um, recently randomized trial between total gastrectomy and proximal gastrectomy from Osaka University. They have also shown that, you know, um, quality of life after proximal gastrectomy is superior. So we have no, um, we don't hesitate to do proximal gastrectomy. And for that purpose, I think reconstruction is very important. And double tract is very popular. It's simpler. And another way to do reconstruction is the esophageal gastro gastrostomy, which is very, you know, complicated if you want to uh, prevent the reflux. And they do kind of double flap, flap method, which is very extremely difficult uh, by laparoscopic surgery. Mm -hmm. So I think uh, usually we perform uh, double tract. It's uh, probably the most popular way to reconstruct after proximal gastrectomy in Japan. Mm -hmm. Yeah, uh, what uh, Dr. Kodera means uh, for our patient, if we uh, anastomosis as follows and uh, distal uh, stomach directly without any uh, preventive uh, a uh, valvular uh, procedure, uh, the patient will suffer uh, with uh, uh, reflux uh, esophagitis, which is uh, uh, sometimes very uh, painful. So uh, uh, some of our patients in old days that they receive that kind of operation, they should receive anti-acid uh, very routinely. Yeah. And, uh, so now uh, 949, uh, uh, we will uh, uh, move to the uh, general discussion uh, uh, Professor Im, next session, uh, Chair, uh, uh, please uh, uh, allow us to uh, go up to 10 after 10. So uh, 20 minutes uh, we want to discuss. And uh, we have, uh, uh, as I mentioned, uh, we have a patient uh, panel, uh, uh, Ms. Wan uh, from Korea, as well as uh, uh, Ms. Uh, uh, Melani Vincelli. I was uh, very much impressed by uh, Ms. Melanie uh, Vincelli, she is uh, so much well informed. Oh, 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 she's like a medical oncologist. <laughs> so uh, I want uh, uh, her wait a little bit more. <laughs> I want to invite uh, Ms. Wan. Uh, uh, she uh, is, uh, she asked a survey uh, with uh, her uh, members uh, uh, in her patient group uh, some uh, questions. Uh, so, so we will ask our uh, uh, panelists uh, to uh, answer uh, the, uh, to our uh, Ms. Wan. Please, Ms. Wan, do you have uh, uh, any uh, questions from your uh, colleagues, uh, including yourself? Yeah, thank you, doc uh, Dr. Yang. Uh, I'm really happy to be here, and I gathered a lot of questions from the patients. The first question is, Concerning about being a surgical clinical a surgical a subject of a clinical trial, is it safe enough for us to do it? Uh huh. Uh, and so uh, uh, nowadays, uh, during even during our uh, conversation uh, presentation, we heard about uh, uh, evidence from uh, clinical trial because uh, that's the way how we improve or uh, prove uh, certain new treatment is better than current standard treatment. That's why we do the clinical study. In uh, session two, you will hear more about clinical trial because uh, new chemotherapy agent, it should be tested uh, compared to uh, uh, current uh, standard treatment. Uh, it's the same way for uh, advanced cancer uh, uh, surgical because uh, for example, robot we talk about, about a lot robot. 
we should uh, uh, verify is uh, better uh, than a conventional uh, laparoscope by clinical study. So uh, I want to uh, invite uh, Professor uh, um, Paul Mansfield about uh, clinical study. Is it safe? His, her question is the patient side, if you're going into clinical study, is it okay? Sure, I, okay. I, think, I think it's important for uh, every patient to recognize that any study that, uh, that we present to them uh, has gone through a very rigorous uh, uh, program that's evaluated uh, by a group that includes not just physicians, but also uh, lawyers and nurses and patients and a, a whole spectrum of, of a swath of, of uh, society. Uh, and they're, they're tasked with trying to make sure that the patient is protected. Uh, I think the days of, of how many clinical studies were done uh, um, 20, 30, 40, 50 years ago uh, are gone. Uh, and uh, I think it's all, but it's also important to ask questions. Uh, I think that anyone who is considering a clinical trial uh, needs to do their due diligence and to understand exactly what they're getting into. Um, and uh, I think at the end of the day, uh, everyone I know here uh, has the patient's best interest at heart. And so uh, sometimes we don't know the answer and these studies are the only way that we will ever find that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, thank you. Uh, as uh, Professor Mansfield uh, uh, mentioned, the so-called ILB, uh, which is a, a, a committee in uh, uh, institutional review board, the key word is a uh, patient protection. So uh, mm -hmm. uh, we uh, try to, uh, to check uh, in, uh, uh, interim analysis or monitoring audit. And uh, that's a very important. Uh, that's actually, that is uh, not only patient uh, protection, but also uh, uh, investigator surgeon protection too, or medical oncology who are inviting, uh, involved in this study. Okay, thank so, you for uh, your next, clear, uh, clear answer. Yeah. Can yeah. I move so, on to the uh, next what, question? Yes, please. Question. Well, someone asked me, uh, there is a sudden pain on down on the left shoulder after having a meal in a hurry or overeating. Does it mm -hmm. need to be checked? And uh, then how about uh, uh, Professor Shi Jae Gan? You are, you are doing uh, many uh, uh, gastrectomy per year and uh, her question, uh, uh, you know, it's quite a common happening probably. Patients mm -hmm. suffer uh, pain on the shoulder uh, mm -hmm. after a meal, a large meal or rush. Uh, how do you explain to uh, that question? Oh, is it, he's uh, not connected? Dr. Bechwell? Uh, yeah, you yeah, I, I think um, you're right. That's not an uncommon complaint is, uh, you know, and part of the education for that comes even before surgery. So hopefully, you know, your surgeon has talked to you about the changes in eating before, before surgery. So we try and get patients ready for that. But I think, you know, having a nutritionist, we often have a dietitian mm -hmm. to the patients in clinic postoperatively, certainly for the initial postoperative phase. Mm -hmm. uh, and that helps them get through that. But then if you're farther out from surgery and you're still having... Probably in her question, there's an answer. So uh, the patient... Uh, suffer that kind of a symptom uh, mm -hmm. after uh, eat, eating too much or rapidly eat. Mm -hmm. So uh, the, uh, rapid, uh, the stomach is uh, small and uh, so it is uh, uh, expanded uh, rapidly, then you feel the pain, refer the pain. That uh, would be the ans uh, answer. So uh, what, any uh, next one? Okay, considering about the alternative medicine, in Asian people uh, prefer to have or take uh, traditional heart medicine or home remedy supplements. Uh, is it uh, recommendable? Wow, uh, <laughs> uh, that is a sensitive question. Right. Uh, yeah, uh, Paul Mansfield, uh, raise hand. Yes, please go ahead. <laughs> uh, yeah, I, so we, we get the same questions here uh, in the US. And what I typically tell patients is that many of the things that we use came from nature. Uh, aspirin came from the bark of a tree. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, taxol came from a plant, uh, the vinca alkaloids. I mean, so there's, there's a whole lot of things that have come from nature. 
Uh, but uh, since the beginning of time, there's also been a lot of snake oil salesmen. And so uh, people who are willing to try to take advantage of people who are, are in need. And so I advise them to be very, very cautious. Mm -hmm. And if something really were a miraculous uh, treatment, uh, we'd all be doing it. Mm. Thank uh, you. Professor Codera, uh, do you have any comment? <clears throat> I think Paul has said enough. I think <laughs> I, I, I just, you know, explain patients in a similar way. Right. Uh-huh. Uh, one, uh, one thing uh, you may want to remember is uh, <clears throat> if you take and then if you got a complication, look whether you can uh, mm -hmm. uh, argue with uh, or... Uh, uh, somebody because you just heard or uh, something is good then take especially a herb um, uh, some uh, extract because it's uh, uh, sometimes uh, toxic to the liver I saw I saw many patients who had uh, uh, severe uh, toxic hepatitis so uh, mm -hmm. it is a uh, when uh, you receive a medication from a doctor if something goes wrong you can argue with a doctor but uh, some uh, uh, some you heard over the shoulders from some uh, someone else, you took it, but you cannot uh, find somebody. You can uh, even sue, uh, but you cannot. So <laughs> that might be a simple uh, uh, judgment. Okay, thank you for your clear answer. And yes. this is the last question. Mm -hmm. uh, well, among us, this is very uh, common symptom, gastric dumping syndrome. Mm -hmm. So are there any good ways prevent us from getting it? Any, any, uh, any, uh, oh, who want to uh, answer this question, professors? Okay, okay. Professor okay. Tugo. Yes, uh, patients uh, of, uh, you know, they always must make questions. They have to ask questions about their safety they mm -hmm. must know the complication rate and the outcome of the kind of technique that their surgeon is going to apply. And depending upon the patient's physical status, their body mass and the life expectancy, because one thing is a 30 year old patient, one thing is a, an old patient that is uh, more than 80, you can apply a uh, more complicated reconstruction yeah. technique aiming to perform a pouch. So aiming to substitute the volume of the original stomach with something that is much different than a single tube. This is the first way that theoretically helps avoiding the, the dumping syndrome that is also preventable, uh, modifying, especially in the first two years of life after the operation, the quality of the diet. So uh, some kinds of uh, food are typically more related to dumping and some habits related to high mass intake are more related to dumping. So counseling, food composition, and uh, possibly the, some reconstruction techniques that uh, include the preparation of a gastric pouch. That is the answer for me. So, uh, Dr. Betjud, uh, Betjewell, uh, uh, how about uh, uh, when your patient uh, complain about uh, dumping, so-called uh, dumping is uh, uh, like uh, 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 hypoglycemic uh, 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 complications such as, so uh, uh, patients are suffering uh, uh, sweat uh, or uh, loss of uh, power and uh, feel like uh, uh, lying down. And uh, how do you uh, uh, recommend uh, Dr. Bajewell. Yeah, yeah, I think I think the, the word dumping can mean a lot of different things to, to a lot of different patients. So I think I think it just rather than classify it as kind of one syndrome, it just takes a lot of time figuring out what they're eating, how you might modify their diet. But I'll say, you know, it is thankfully it's a minority. You know, I, I think some some commonly reported numbers are it's 20% of patients that may experience, you know, symptoms consistent with dumping and another 20% where it's kind of more of a long-term problem. But but it's usually manageable with changes in diet, fiber, um, and um, so so it, so it can be controlled. Although it, it takes a little bit of time, thankfully it usually gets better. Uh, Professor Codera, how do you uh, uh, recommend uh, your patients? 
Well, I think I uh, ask my patients to, uh, you know, always have something sweet around you so that you can take glucose and when you have a hypoglycemia. Mm. And I think damping syndrome does not happen to the patient after, just after surgery because they're very cautious about feeding. They're afraid of eating food. But when they get used to uh, their situation, they start to, uh, you know, eat a lot and, you know, yeah. very quickly. And mm -hmm. that is a cause of damping. So I think mm -hmm. patients get damping syndrome sometime after, you know, after some interval. And then mm -hmm. I would just explain them that the hypoglycemia is the uh, cause of the, uh, most of these syndromes. So uh, and I just uh, ask them to eat something, preferably before they get the hypoglycemia. So, I, mean, mm. I mean, eat something between the meals, etc. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, uh, probably um, uh, others will agree. So uh, instead of uh, eating something when you suffer the symptom, but mm -hmm. uh, I would recommend the patient after the meal, and uh, when uh, he feels a uh, uh, stomach is uh, going to empty, uh, mm -hmm. to eat uh, some sweet uh, 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 cookie uh, or right. something, uh, uh, but not too much uh, uh, mm -hmm. uh, sweet. So in your uh, handbag, uh, carry something. <laughs> or carry after it. meal, mm -hmm. you have uh, something like that. Thank so you. maybe we uh, move to the next uh, uh, patient panel, Ms. Melani uh, Vinsali. Could you uh, uh, share or us with uh, your questions? One of the questions I was asked was, um, have there been any studies to show if there makes a big difference in the recovery time for someone that's had a total gastrectomy that's had a feeding tube versus someone that has not had a feeding tube? When I first came out of surgery, I have no stomach. I was stage four. It hit my liver and my lungs. I was given six to nine months to live 13 years ago. So I've been living without a stomach for 13 years. I was not able to endure a feeding tube the minute I had one, but the minute they put the um, glop, whatever that is, in me, I projectile vomited and my doctor said, no, you're not, I'm not going to force you to go throw it. In hindsight, I kind of wish I did have it because coming home and then trying to eat, there was so much pressure mentally and physically that it was very difficult for me. So physically and mentally, there's a lot of pressure on patients to eat. Is, it, is there any studies out there that shows that it's easier with the feeding tube? Is it, is it better on the patient mentally and physically with the feeding tube? Yeah, first of all, you doesn't look like uh, uh, without a stomach. <laughs> and uh, 13 years, wonderful. Yes, you're yes, uh, very happy stomach. to be here. Yes. Very happy uh, to be here, yes. yes. Uh, so, uh, 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 Professor Dugo. Yes, you this is a yeah. very important question. And um, you have uh, heard from uh, uh, Vivian Strong how important is diagnostic laparoscopy. And nowadays, placing a feeding tube, especially in the rising amount of patients with cardiac tumors that very often cannot eat regularly and need a preoperative treatment, is a very important preliminary step that can be easily applied in the course of diagnostic laparoscopy. In some of these patients that arrive to the operation with the feeding tube, we leave it in place because unfortunately there is the possibility that some patients have complications so that their ability to intake food is, uh, is impaired. From these kind of patients, we have learned how a correct and well-measured post-operative enteral feeding through a tube is important in reestablishing a good uh, general condition. And now there are no studies that have been published, but there are ongoing studies. I know at uh, least a, a couple of them in Europe where the feeding tube as an ad in post-op patients is important for their recovery time. So you have uh, focused on a very important uh, uh, subject. Thank you for the question. Yeah. Yeah, but uh, uh, in uh, uh, Asia, uh, uh, Japan, or Korea, uh, probably no uh, place uh, do a, a feeding uh, uh, tube, a feeding jejunostomy after total gastrectomy. Uh, the purpose would be 
the protection or uh, just in case uh, esophageal jejunostomy has a leakage, uh, feeding jejunostomy can uh, keep patient uh, eating, uh, 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 feeding, I mean, yes. And uh, so, uh, uh, so I, I am not uh, quite sure feeding uh, jejunostomy uh, surely uh, provide any uh, nutritional benefit except uh, when the patient have a complication because uh, uh, as long as uh, as far as jejunostrum is uh, intact, you can uh, eat, uh, although uh, like any other uh, patient with a total gastrectomy, you have to divide the food. And uh, some studies going on uh, uh, like a, a parenteral uh, support, uh, Preoperative or postoperative parenteral support of nutrition can help uh, that <clears throat> nutrition uh, status. Uh, so, Professor, uh, Professor Young, yes. some oh, people yeah. have raised hands. Yes. Uh, so, Professor uh, Paul Mansfield, and uh, next, uh, uh, Professor <laughs> Vivian Strong. <laughs> so, uh, I just Brian. Uh, actually, I don't know if Brian wants to talk to this, but uh, he's done uh, some work with this. Uh, we have. I used to put feeding tubes in everybody for hypex and then for uh, gastrectomies, total subtotals. Uh, I don't put them in anybody anymore. Yeah, um, wow. But what I do is I tack uh, part of the enteroenterostomy up to the abdominal wall with two little metal clips that if the patient does down the line need a feeding tube, then interventional radiology can just slide one right in using those like landing lights. Um, but I think uh, there are a lot of complications to uh, uh, feeding tubes. And I think when we, when I use them much more liberally, uh, I think I underappreciated uh, just how many problems patients had. Mm -hmm. Professor Shi Jaegan and then uh, Vivian Strong, yes. Uh, in, in, in my centers, uh, some patients uh, after total uh, gastroectomy use a, a feeding tube in all this. Somehow, uh... Nanjing is a very advanced uh, or new hospital, but uh, they need uh, some improvement <laughs> in uh, IP. So, uh, uh, Vivian Strong, uh, could you uh, please? Uh, uh. Sure. No, I, I wanted to mention that I, I agree with some of the comments that have been made. Um, we look, I do not routinely put feeding tubes in patients who are getting a total gastrectomy. And we went back to look at our data because some institutions do use feeding tubes. And in our data, we found that only about one in 20 patients after total gastrectomy actually required some additional nutritional support with a feeding tube, which usually could be placed quite easily uh, by our GI people if needed. Wow. And as Dr. Young also pointed out, there are pros and cons to having a feeding tube. The feeding tubes don't come without potential issues, bowel obstructions, other issues like what you experienced, Milani. So I think you have to be very careful in that. And the most important thing is to provide very strong, good nutritional support. So mm -hmm. we have a nutrition team, as many of these high volume centers that specialize in gastric cancer do, do. And I think that's probably the most important component because with good support, good advice from nutritionists and from the physician team, you definitely can get through that period. And I think oftentimes more successfully without feeding tubes. Excellent. Excellent. Thank you. Uh, Thank you very much. Yes. Uh, now it's a uh, ten eleven. So uh, uh, I'm afraid uh, uh, because of a time uh, uh, limit, uh, we may uh, because the next session presentation uh, are waiting. Uh, but I found that we have uh, lots of questions, uh, more uh, 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 active discussion than last year, and uh, hopefully we can find uh, some. Uh, other way, not only uh, this kind of a Zoom meeting, but uh, other way of uh, sharing uh, some uh, discussion through some uh, website of a, a DDF, or uh, we may uh, should uh, 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 develop some uh, new way of easy communication between patient and uh, this uh, uh, world famous uh, uh, experts. So uh, thank you very much, uh, all the. Uh, our moderators, speakers, and the panelists, and uh, especially our patient, uh, 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 to a patient, uh, uh, Melanie uh, Vincelli and uh, Ms. Wong. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, let's uh, 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 listen to the uh, next session. Thank you, everybody. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.